Good evening all and uh, welcome to this Beyond Boundaries webinar series presented to you by the Office of International Partnerships at Shivnadar University. I understand and I see that there's a global audience participating in today's uh, webinar session. So thank you all for joining in from early morning hours to late evening hours. Today we have with us Provost Lee and Dr. Rupma Manjuri Ghosh, uh, our moderator for the session who actually conceptualized this whole series. Dr. Partha Chatterjee will be taking this discussion forward with them. Over to you, Dr. Chatterjee. Thank you so much, Ashita. And once again, Welcome everyone. Uh, I wouldn't say good morning or good evening <laughs> because as you know, the time zones that you are in, I have no idea where you are, right? So, but I'm very happy that you could join from various part of the world. And special thanks to Provost Lee for being here today. It's a privilege and honor for us to host you today. Yeah? Uh, I'll not take much time at the very beginning, uh, but just introduce this series. Uh, we have been doing it from the last year. We have had, uh, had several people, very eminent people being part of this series. The whole idea came about uh, last year when we thought we suddenly felt so disconnected and you know, separated from all things that we wanted to, to do. And uh, this, is, uh, this, has, this platform has become a great way to exchange ideas and think about how to take things forward, right? So today we will talk about global partnership and you know, it couldn't have been more topical than that. Today in many ways, we see a much more fragmented world than in the recent years. Hopefully through these kind of conversations and through these kind of you know, collaborations that we can forge, we can reverse that and we can usher into a very different world where uh, collaborations and uh, you know, connections are the norm, right? So with that, um, let me also introduce you to, to, to uh, introduce you to our two um, panelists here. Uh, I just saw a chat here that my voice was not uh, heard. Uh, is that okay? It's Can better you... now, it's better. So I'll be very close to the uh, speaker here. <laughs> the, uh, and, you know, I couldn't have been happier to get uh, anyone else other than these two very eminent scientists, academic leaders, and of course, you know, the people who are actually taking two great universities forward, right? Uh, to begin with, let me introduce Professor Rupa Manjari Ghosh. You know, whenever she's there in a session, I feel like I don't need to introduce her because in India, she's so well known. But given the global audience, let me nevertheless do that a little bit. Um, she's been with Shivnadar University since 2012, and she's been the vice chancellor since 2016. And she has really transformed the university in the last few years. And one great achievement during that period is that Shivnadar University has become an institute of eminence, uh, among, the, among the youngest institute of eminence that is there in India. And the government of India has chosen 10 private and 10 public universities to be institute of eminences, and we are the youngest one to get that recognition right now. Uh, but before that, she was also the founding director of the Natural Sciences, and she has built a stellar natural sciences school at Shivnata University uh, with fantastic labs and even more, you know, even better people uh, at the university. So, uh, she's also the recipient of Sri Shakti Science Samman for her original contribution to science. She is a leader in science education in India. She serves as an expert in the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, and in several committees. She is, of course, a, an excellent researcher, teacher, orator, and an academic administrator at par. So, with She's also, by the way, a great champion for gender justice and environment consciousness in higher education systems. And Shivnadi University uh, witnesses some of that. So with that, let me welcome Dr. Rupa Manjari Ghosh. Provost Lee is the 14th Provost of University of Chicago. As Provost, 
faculty is responsible for academic and research programs across the university and oversees the university's budget, needless to say. She's been with the university for long. She has joined in, uh, Chicago in 1998 in the chemistry department, though her PhD is in physics, as is Rupa's, right? So, um, um, and then of course she has done stellar research. Her science career has been fantastic. From there, she has been the vice provost for research. And as a vice provost for research, she has seen you know, increased access to research funding and resources, particularly federal funding, university research administration, research safety, you know, research computing, research development support, as well as endeavors in science that cuts across division schools institutes. She has played a lead role in all kinds of universities activities, but particularly one that I want to mention is the university's activities and partnerships in Hong Kong. She has been a champion in building up the uh, Chicago's presence in Hong Kong. She is a, an elected member of the College of Fellows of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering and a fellow of the American Physical Society. Her research focus lies in the area of membrane biophysics and she is author or co-author of more than 125 scholarly publications. With that, um, let's start today's uh, session. I would invite uh, Provost Lee to uh, actually, well, uh, let me start where I think uh, in our whole program, I think it was Professor Rupa Munji goes to give the welcome and introductory remarks and then Provost Lee will make a presentation. So Rupa, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Patso. Uh, and uh, I'm really, really uh, honored and privileged to share this with Provost Lee. Uh, with the University of Chicago, we have been trying to build some friendly uh, conversations, I would say. And Lenny, of course, in her new role has been instrumental. So it's really a celebration. And I say that because, you know, uh, as I was sh sharing with Provost Lee uh, before we went live, that I've been in a celebration mode for the last one month almost. Uh, as Partho mentioned, uh, because of people like Partho, I take the credit because of the people I got at SNU, uh, that we have become an institution of eminence. We signed this memorandum, the contract with the uh, government uh, Ministry of Education uh, on the 16th of March. Then we have had some expansion in our leadership new directors joining, and then uh, the 6th of April was our 10th anniversary. We celebrated by celebrating our faculty and staff members for excellence in research, teaching, and service. Today evening, actually, at 5 o'clock, this is now 8.10, uh, we celebrated our students who have done excellent work in the curriculum and then outside curriculum research a program that I very fondly call our program, OUR. Opportunities for Undergraduate Research, OUR. So those who have excelled in there, this is a very special program and I'm very proud of it. So I, I thought that um, the celebration continues when Provost Lee joins the webinar uh, and uh, accepts our invitation uh, because academics is what we really enjoy. And I, I, I know that today's conversation would be, but it would be the beginning of the larger conversation. So. To begin with, since Partho posed the question of uh, international collaboration and partnership uh, to the forefront of today's discussion, I wanted to bas uh, basically say what we have been facing. This is Beyond Boundaries Seminar version two. In the version one, we have been talking about the impact of COVID uh, in, in all aspects of life, you know, starting from, uh, and, and academics, higher education to economy to uh, health. And uh, in this version, we are looking at much more, uh, you know, uh, bigger issues. Uh, what COVID did, of course, it brought forward some importance of some issues. You know, one thing I feel it has encouraged and all over the world I'm seeing the trend is collaboration. You know, everybody faced the same problem. It didn't matter whether you are in India, US, UK, or in Italy. Uh, everybody was under this attack of this pandemic. It was un unheard of, the situation, and uh, it was literally unprecedented. So sharing of experiences, you know, when the campus got locked down, everything was shut, uh, that uh, it's, a, it's really something that uh, we had to come together to conquer. The good 
thing for Shivnada University. Uh, we are located near Delhi. So it's in the national capital region of Delhi, uh, not far from the international airport, a uh, two hour drive, a nice pleasant drive actually to a nice campus. Uh, but what we have been lucky to do is we have been agile because we are young. And that agility saw us through. We have been a little ahead of the curve. One of the first to uh, move everything online, uh, be it in, uh, you know, in this residential campus, all the clubs and societies that were for extracurricular or co-curricular activities, even those move online. But thanks to very brave faculty and technical support, our, online, our classes moved online. But those are not permanent solutions. Those are like band-aid kind of uh, treatment to uh, <laughs> cut because uh, we have basically the live classes were uh, you know, broadcasted in a synchronous mode mostly. Very few people did asynchronous teaching. But all of that, uh, when we exchange, for example, our views in a collaborative mode with Harvard Business School, uh, through Shikan Data, who has been a friend and an advisor, uh, we learned that we're doing and facing more or less similar stuff. So strengthening each other's views, figuring it out what to do, because major lesson learned was in teaching, for example, that you need to go slow. If you just translate what you have been doing in your face-to-face on-site mode, exactly the same design, same model in online, it's too stressful for your students. And so those are uh, now it's been so long that we have almost you know it's become habitual to all of that. But we also missed like somebody has put a question. Please elaborate on the OUR. I I, I would love to do it. It's my pet topic actually. But it's opportunity for undergraduate research where students who are doing reasonably well because we don't want to distract them too much are allowed, first year students are not allowed, but they can study what exactly is going on. They're allowed to choose a mentor from anywhere in SNU, not in your department, may not be in your department, may not be even in your school. And uh, you write a short proposal, the university funds it, funds it by a very small amount, but it takes care of your consumable uh, expenditure. And uh, we teach the students the nuances of research. And as I keep joking that there are people who are wise, who know what they know. The people who are idiots, who think they know, but they do not really know when they do not know. And that leaves the rest of researchers, intelligent people, who need to precisely know what they do not know. So when you know precisely what you do not know, you have formulated your research question. And I think more or less roughly, I mean, uh, I'm joking, but. This is really the crux of the matter. This is what we teach our students. We are how to formulate exactly the research question, who is what you exactly do not know. And from that, they get the help of our researchers, our faculty, and uh, all the support they get. In the end, there is an undergraduate conference. We have been doing it from 2014, May. And just come, we try to select the best awards. They all submit a report. And some of them have been published in established journals with undergraduates as lead authors. India doesn't lack in human resources. And I think our 17, 18 year olds are our brightest. So uh, I believe in catching them young, training them. This is not for a research career. Most people ask me, you know, so you expect all of them to be researchers? Of course, I expect. That's my personal <laughs> expectation. I expect them to, to contribute to research and innovation. But even if you go for innovation, meaning you have your own startup or you go to research, uh, R&D in industry, whatever you do, this experience of exploration, the nuances, understanding a, a domain which is completely new to you, how you relearn and uh, excel in that, that training uh, serves them uh, really well, doesn't matter what they choose to do in their career. I feel that uh, I described previously SNU by uh, this term called global. We are global in our outlook, but we are deeply rooted in our local context. But in the global in the outlook and deeply rooted in our context, I see many commonalities. The best way for us to move forward would be when we stop competing and we start collaborating, when I can turn our competitors into collaborators. Uh, becoming an institution of eminence was the kind of a long, tiring, three year long process. But I think looking ahead, I feel that was probably the easy part. And the real task is lying ahead. And it has been very successful 10 years. 
and I'm looking forward to a more successful 10 years of SNU. And in that, partnership would be the only way forward. I visualize that partnership of uh, national and international collaborations, private, uh, public, industry, academia, all of it is, constitutes what I call the ecosystem that is needed. No longer you can say, oh, University of Chicago in isolation is an island of excellence. That doesn't happen anymore. So, but this, universities like yours would be the driver of this ecosystem where it would also ensure quality. Uh, because I don't see rankers bringing in quality assurances. I think this is typically a job to be done by uh, you know, academics in universities. So, you know, this is one topic part two. I have so much to say that I can go on and on, but I, I think in the interest of time, I'm, I'll stop now and I'll be eagerly looking, for, you know, waiting to hear Provost Lee in, uh, and her thoughts on partnership and collaboration in the age of COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now I request Provost Lee to do her presentation. Well, I want to start by thanking both of you for the kind invitation to be part of this celebration. I am honored and privileged to be here today uh, to share with you uh, some of our thoughts from the University of Chicago perspective on international collaborations. And so I hope you can see my screen right now with no issues. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, so this gives you a sort of overview, so to speak, or, or literally an overview of our university uh, campus. We are on the south side of um, Chicago and just sort of five miles from downtown Chicago, very easily uh, located to the O'Hare Airport. And so we welcome all of you to come visit when the um, conditions um, allow us to do so. So already, um, Dean Chatterjee gave a very sort of thorough um, introduction and thank you for your kind words of who I am and where I came from. And indeed, um, since February of last year, I have started my current position serving as the provost of the University of Chicago. Um, and I am about to complete my 23rd year at the university. And like my colleagues on screen, um, I came to the US as a foreign student, uh, starting as an undergraduate student in the study of engineering. And, um, and I have been here since, I wouldn't disclose what year that was, um, that I have been here. And so as provost at the university, um, uh, acting as the chief academic officers, and as someone who has really been involved in international centers and personally benefited from having international colleagues to address some of the big challenges and issues that we are facing in our scholarly um, endeavors, I am very much into and support international collaboration. And so before I go into that, let me give you a sense of what international collaboration has meant and what is University of Chicago stand for in that realm. So the University of Chicago's most fundamental characteristic is really its focus on vigorous inquiry. We have worked very hard to create an environment of free expression of productive argument and open discourse. And this allow us to create a, what we call a challenging environment, but that constant reevaluation of assumptions is really what gets us to the most vigorous conclusion and has the greatest potential impact on whatever areas of inquiry that we want to put into. One of the interesting things about leading a university with such a history and a strong sense of itself is that one must reinforce the enduring value while at the same time making for the value to be manifested in new and responsive way as the world around us change. And um, Vice Chancellor Ghosh sort of point to our experience over the last year that we have really forced, been forced to pivot because of the ever-changing conditions that it is around us and also changing you know, regulations, changing rules, changing access. And so one really need to be able to be agile. And, and if anything, COVID has taught us that is something that we would need to stay with us for sort of the rest of the time because we have sort of learned how to pivot to this um, new environment that is around us. And so the question at hand is, why is international and global collaboration important? And why does that really matter to all of us? 
Well, since the inception of the university, the University of Chicago has always maintained a global perspective. And this began with our second president, uh, Judson, who led the commission that helped establish the China Medical Board and has continued throughout our history. So for example, in the context of India, in 1936, University of Chicago alumnus initiated the proposal to set up a school for professional social work in Mumbai, which is now known as the Tata Institute for Social Sciences. And when we're sort of down to the current day, there's really a set of important problems that impact people and environment across borders and regions. Issues around climate change, energy, migration, economic development, and urbanization are just a few examples. Engaging with our colleagues around the world to actually address these problems allows us to bring global expertise to advance field-defining research and actually develop solutions. So we can challenge deeply held assumptions and benefit from the brightest mind in the world, and in the process, build lasting relationship between people and institutions. And I'm grateful to, to have the opportunity to be here today, as this is one of the steps for our two institutions to actually build lasting relationships. Collaborations with partner allows for different perspectives, different cohorts, different environment, and different use cases to come together in powerful way. So for example, new sensors and cloud-based agricultural practices can be engineered to both to test soil on a farm in Illinois, as well as to monitor water quality in the Ganges River. True solutions are best developed through collaboration throughout the R&D process. There are, however, challenging assumptions that one has to keep in mind. So the challenging assumptions that we have in this context can be referred to multiple things. We are seeking to create an environment in which problems of global importance are confronted by scholars from around the world, working together, exchanging ideas, and challenging one another. And it's, it is in this bringing together of the multiple perspective that actually create a synthesis of diverse experiences and opinions, which can help address these problems in a vigorous and inclusive way. And I, I stress both the vigorous part as well as the inclusive parts, which are as important. And in a more abstract sense, one of the fundamental things that happen when we spend time in another culture is that you learn about history, culture, society, and assumptions that might be different from what you're familiar with, which encourage us to think through the set of assumptions in our own culture, how we have subscribed to them, and how there is sometimes not a single answer to a seemingly simple questions. So we believe an international experience and international collaborations plays a very important role for the habits of mind that we want our students, our faculty developed, and our faculty to exemplify. So I have shown you the slide of the U Chicago approach to global collaborations. And at the university, it's really the faculty and researchers that drive the institution agenda. So we have developed some infrastructure solutions to actually support and amplify their important work. And by identifying key partners and areas of shared strength or opportunity across campus, we can actually see where we have the critical mass of faculty interest and where an institutional partnership might be able to smooth the way for more impactful research. In addition to building opportunities and access for our own faculty, these institutional partnerships build relationship and trust with local leaderships, government, as well as community institutions. And finally, the increase in cultural knowledge and experience that comes from those close working relationship actually make us better partners with a more nuanced understanding of the world and how to operate around it. So let me move to give you a few of the examples um, that we have collaborated in. And so the first one has to do with a uh, longstanding interest and collaboration. And this is an academic example on the Medipol Academy of Higher Education. 
We have a particularly strong relationship with the Academy of Higher Education, and in particular, at Castuber Medical School. Our faculty are working with their colleagues on issues ranging from testing new models for doctor-patient relationship to monitoring education for medical students around trans-affirmative methods of communication and treatment. And over the course of the past eight years, we started with visits between Chicago and India to make introductions, which led to single collaboration on diagnostic curriculum and has now expanded to involve five different research and training projects and disciplines across the biological sciences. As a second example, I want to move on to a policy related matter. And this has to do with the Gujarat admissions trading system. The Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago, or we call it EPIC, in concert with the Gujarat Pollution Control Board has helped launch and evaluate the world's first emissions trading system for particulate pollution in Gujarat. Under this program, the government first caps the total amount of air particulate matter that can be emitted over a period of time by all the plants together. A fixed number of permits which allow a certain quantity of emissions are allocated to each plant and can be brought and sold between peers. The system reduced the total cost of pollution regulations for the government. It also helped increase firm profits for plants, improve reporting, and reduce particulate pollution by 29%. So how do we sort of get our feet wet and get ourselves planted um, in these global and uh, international uh, collaboration? And one of the methods, so this is just a picture of the establishment of the trading system in, in Gujarat. One of our, the way of how we go about doing it is really um, creating global centers around the world. And so uh, Dean Chatterjee has pointed to my involvement in our latest UN campus in Hong Kong uh, that was sort of opened up in November of 2018 but with our interim center presence in Hong Kong since 2014. Um, you very, uh, you're very well aware of our center in, in Delhi um, that was opened up six years ago, and we just celebrated our 10th year anniversary, very much like you do uh, in your institution, our presence in Beijing through our center in Beijing. Also in Europe, we have the center in Paris that serve as a hub for many of our undergraduate activity and study abroad program. And coupled with these international global centers are various campuses and uh, our presence uh, around the world um, to foster our international uh, research and research collaboration. The Chicago House and Luxor will be celebrating its centennial um, in a couple of years. And we just opened our Booth London campus, the second version of our campus um, uh, earlier last year. And so these are just some of the activities and the center location that allow us to facilitate that. Um, the, our global centers in Beijing, Delhi, Hong Kong, Paris really provide a home away from home to allow our faculty and students to more easily interface with their peers around the world and conduct impactful research and programming like the examples that I have described. And the university also has a few discipline specific center as shown there, which support the various units as well as the project that are there. Part of it is very important for us is really providing a platform for our training of the next generation of the global citizen. And so a lot of the work, a lot of our involvement is really with that in mind, with our students being situated in these international, in the center of these international work and international collaboration. In addition to empowering students to challenge their own assumption through study abroad and exchanges, it is important for me to acknowledge the role of international collaboration that plays in recruiting great students and engaging them in their scholarly pursuit to push the, the next step for all of us in a global society. So UChicago intellectual community is strengthened by the undergraduate and graduate student who comes from around the world, and they are a critical component of our research partnership. 
we recruit graduate student and postdoc with new ideas and new tools to come to Chicago and to contribute to new direction. And these students bringing them into these international work, international collaboration would help them to create knowledge that is impactful for the future and also impactful for their successes as this is how they are going to be living in a new world of being a global citizen. With all these opportunity, there are of course challenges that we have to sort of overcome. I wouldn't say that they're barriers, but they're challenges that we would sort of um, have to augment and to rise above them in order to have a meaningful collaboration uh, to be in place. So it is true that global collaboration does not necessarily have to be frictionless and there could be impediment, but what we would like to emphasize is the tremendous amount of opportunities that bringing people from around the world together would, would bring about to problems. Of course, geopolitical situations and relationship are constantly shifting, shifting and sometimes volatile. And th this can cause a variety of problems for academic collaboration, ranging from travel re restriction, which we see and is highlighted by the uh, current pandemic that we're in, to sort of some issues uh, brought about by extra control concern to increase regulatory uh, scrutiny on specific topics. While this is a reality, we take the position that academic collaboration actually transcends our politics. Regardless of where we are working, we always seek to carry out on our mission of vigorous inquiry and intellectual challenge while maintaining within the law, which is not always an easy path to navigate, but we have and are committed to do so. In the area that we're talking about, about science, um, particularly in the area of applied sciences and intellectual property, researchers around the world are increasingly working to move basic discovery into new products, new therapeutics, new methods. And at the University of Chicago and partner university around the world, we see how much impact can come from faculty entrepreneur and partnership with established company. While issue of translation are perhaps more complicated across countries and languages, interdisciplinary science also requires translating across domains and data and navigating various national and international regulations. Many of the big challenges that we're seeking and we are seeking an answer to in research require faculty and students to cross these boundaries in order to really make progress. And how we collaborate disciplines and how we collaborate across country provide some of the great opportunities for us. Going back to the pandemic that we are in, it has really demonstrated both the challenges and benefit of global academic collaborations. Um, Vice Chancellor Gulch has pointed to some of them, how we have learned from each other, how we have sort of informed each other and how we have collaborated to come up with, for example, the unprecedented speed at which an elixir right now, the vaccine has actually from the bench top to someone's arm. It is, it is really an incredible feat that we have witnessed. With the international boundary comes different public health circumstances across countries and institution means an even progress on some of the share project and which sometimes are perhaps especially difficult for us being in academics. But on the positive side, really they, as we are, as, as is really seen in this improvement and these really fast steps and fast tracking that we're making um, in our scientific discovery and translation from that discovery um, into uh, therapeutics, we understand the importance of scientific transparency and collaboration across the border has actually never been better demonstrated or appreciated in the public eyes um, and with enormous impact on human life as we have seen very vividly under this COVID um, pandemic. COVID has also demonstrated how solution to global problems may have universal element, but also need culturally sensitive implementation. So, with that, I hope I have given you a sense of what we feel about 
international collaboration in the sciences from an institutional perspective. And as a biophysicist um, who has been involved in understanding how and what are the molecular bases for disease and how international collaborations in solving the um, disease like the uh, pulmonary disease that I work on, you know, neonatal respiratory distress, distress syndrome and acute um, respiratory distress syndrome, really it is a cross boundary and we benefited a great deal from international collaborations around the world to push this front. Many other diseases that we work on uh, with Parkinson disease, understanding the, the basis of the formation or in Alzheimer's uh, disease, really the international community in scientific collaboration has actually pushed the field ahead. So I will stop here and I really want to end by thank you again for this incredible opportunity to be part of your celebration. And we look forward to continuing our partnership and discussion as we move forward to your next decade. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. It was a very thought provoking presentation. Mm, I think what you pointed out, you know, as the best demonstration we could have thought of that scientific collaboration is, has to be global, right? Is the vaccine that we, I have already got one shot. Or Me shot too. It's <laughs> going to get to tomorrow. So, you know, this is really a triumph of science as much as a triumph of globalization, right? A global cooperation. Yet in many ways, we see, you know, the impediments to global collaborations and cooperations have increased in recent times. And how do we, as an academic community, do you think, do we need to do something different, something special, something to surmount this and ensure that humanity is better off through these collaborations? Well, maybe I will start by addressing that, yes, we have seen sort of increased regulation, increased scrutiny for international dis, um, research, but Fundamentally, a university as we know it really rely on the knowledge of, you know, citizens from different parts of the world. Since the inception of the history of the University of Chicago, we have really relied on bringing talented minds to the university, irrespective of where they come from, which country they are, what ethnicity, they come together to pursue a genuine of getting to the bottom of things, to create new knowledge, to push the boundary of existence. So I think, you know, as an academic institution and as an academic community, we need to make sure that our government understand the importance of this type of global collaborations to really not move only our national agenda forward, but the global uh, agenda forward um, and, and put us into higher heights. Absolutely, I couldn't have agreed more than what you said. Uh, also, I mean, kind of continuing with that thing, uh, funding, right? I mean, research funding still remains, particularly science research funding still remains uh, very much dependent on governments. And often that means it's about national interest on what the nation is looking at rather than looking at a much more global and international context, right? So is there a way that we can reorganize research funding or we should be thinking about organizing research funding in a different way so that we can kind of not only benefit through these collaborations, but actually tackle some of these real challenges which are global in, you know, in any way that you can think of. So I, it's to both of you in some sense because both of you have been involved in mm -hmm. government, uh, you know, funding <laughs> agencies and getting funds. So from the two different, two very different countries and contexts, but mm -hmm. both of you can- Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, to put it very simply, you know, Bruce Lee also talked about it. Many of the issues that we are dealing with today are of global nature. I mean, if you look at climate change to sustainability issues and health, uh, like uh, what we have just uh, been all witnessing. So they are global in nature. And I think everybody understands that, you know, it's not conflict of ideas. I see a question and there. Uh, it's uh, 
the, we, we actually need these conflicts for new ideas to emerge. If everything is in harmony, then churning stops. And then without churning, new ideas do not emerge. So it's not uh, conflict. I mean, conflict, I, I always welcome conflict. I mean, uh, I always see immense opportunity in conflicts of ideas. I don't mean uh, physical mm -hmm. conflict. <laughs> but uh, then uh, when ideas can connect, you have new solutions. And uh, everywhere, I think people should be made to read this research on uh, diversity, uh, that diverse teams are smarter, all right? That has been proven in the corporate sector, but it applies to universities as well. And so diversity, I mean, it's not in terms of just gender, but it's actually these cultural diversities. Different perspective to attack a global problem is extremely important. So national problems are miniature forms. Some are local, which you need to, because we are at, for example, look at India. I mean, um, probably probably knows a bit because of their long history of associates. I keep saying it, you know, there's different layers in this country. I cannot just focus only on millennials, right? I have to, so this is not Chicago's problem. This would be pretty much Shivnada University's problem. So we'll be, uh, you know, facing, but I think I can accelerate our progress by not repeating the mistakes others have done because we are essentially so slow in some way in India that we can learn from the wisdom of looking at others. So I think global cooperation, following what uh, urbanization you know, plans in Singapore to everything that people have done, which we are going through in Greater Noida where SNU is located. So I think it would be really foolish to say, I'll just keep my eyes closed and I'll not look at the world at all. And I'll just look at what is next door uh, to me. So I think universities have been the zones of openness. And I think we are uh, coming back to that feeling very strongly, thanks to COVID, thanks to these partnerships, thanks to this. But yeah, I also see that there has to be a, um, uh, uh, there has to be a, some kind of complementary partnerships. You know, I bring some strength to the table, you bring some strength to the table. Two of us work, it cannot be based on weaknesses. So I think these strengths are emerging. If we go to Chicago, we know what they're strong in, what I don't have. But I also tell them what I have in these 10 years have become very strong in. And so the partnership works. So I think this is going to continue. The government's got to listen to it because this is the only way forward. I mean, collaboration is the only way forward. So I feel very optimistic about it. And the proof of the pudding in its uh, right is when you make it successful, like after the vaccine, Dive, everybody is now talking about it. So I think you need to have success of these mm -hmm. efforts. It cannot be all in the idea space. It has to be on uh, applied space as well. And once that happens, you give confidence to everybody. That's the question of credibility of partnerships. Right. I complete in agreement. Um, and just to add, the partnership, the whole is actually greater than the sum of its part. With the complementarity, with the diversity of ideas that coming in, you actually bring different perspective to solve the problem. And, and I strongly believe that that actually move the progress um, forward in a much faster pace. Um, you asked the question about sort of, you know, should we rethink and how should we think about the funding model that is in place? Um, and as Vice Chancellor, gosh, uh, Kalila, take there are local sort of level type of issues that needs sort of national local support, but there are also international global issues that really requires each of the government to chip in to this sort of bigger issue. So, you know, for example, um, since both of us are physicists in training, you know, the cosmic microwave background, uh, CMBS4, um, is really a global international uh, uh, collaboration that everyone brings different techniques, um, different know-how, uh, different specialty and expertise to the table. And it's cross you know, national boundary. And um, with this one sort of, you know, very concentrated and singular idea to really understand the start of the universe. And so, so it is, it is a, a, I think, you know, a unifying theme to bring scientists across the globe together to solve a real, really big problem that not a single person uh, or single group or single country alone um, can, can do. Thank you. And I know you have to leave at nine, so we still have a few minutes. I'll take, start taking some questions from the audience at this point, and then we'll see how much time we have, and then we can continue this discussion, right? So 
the first question here is, do you think global collaborations act as catalyst in the field of research? Well, I think the answer is pretty obvious, but I'll still uh, let you elaborate on that, right? How basically, I, I, say, I think we can think it of in a little broader context that, uh, you know, when we think about science, often we think about labs and, you know, very narrow problems and all, but how collaboration in science can actually lead to a peaceful and better world of sorts, right? So, I think global collaborations is definitely catalytic in nature, right? Just by sort of seeing how a particular problem um, is viewed and solved from one culture, which might not be exactly the same as how you do, but you add to that. And so you bring in, you bring back new ideas to go into directions which you might not have thought about. And that sort of becomes autocatalytic to, to bring all the new inventions and new directions to whatever projects that might be. Yeah, in the Indian context, I use the word a lot of, uh, you know, we are so busy sometimes solving our local ones, we forget, you know, you need recharging. Ideas are not generated if you just keep yourself closed in this. And internationalization is the, the, the biggest uh, spectrum that you can open up yourself to. And the perspectives that uh, Bruce Lee talked about, I completely agree. Uh, we approach the same problem differently and we learn both, uh, you know, it's a win-win situation. And it's really one plus one is not two, one plus one is four or more. So I think that's the beauty of collaboration. All right. Uh, I think there's a long question. Let me try and read that out. Um, I have a doubt about when collaborations take place, different people come together and put their mind in it, which has its advantages and disadvantages. So how do you think we can deal with the disadvantages such as idea conflicts, different grounds, et cetera, effectively and efficiently? I think Rupa has partially addressed that already, that it's not only, you know, that we don't have to be in sync all the time. Conflict of ideas always help. And you know that's exactly the whole point of having webinars and seminars, and that we can actually bounce ideas, get new ideas and conflicts. But uh, I think you know I'll let Provost Lee to add to that if she wants to. Yeah. Yeah, I, and and for us, you know, coming from the University of Chicago and a, a strong believer of the freedom of expression of the various ideas, this is the foundational piece for the university for any sort of you know intellectual pursuit to really flourish. Having different ideas and in defending the ideas, in listening to the other ideas, is when you sharpen the idea, or maybe I have not looked at it in a way um, that the other person has looked at it. And there is some truth in, you know, in each person's way. And so you sharpen, you reshape your position. And I think, you know, of course, we can imagine there are scenarios whereby the personality um, of the people involved might really give rise to a real conflict from the idea. But I think if we are willing to listen and understand and be in the other person's shoes, be it from different ground, um, be it from, you know, different ideology, but understand where it's coming from and help inform us to give a richer picture to the question that is at hand. I'll take one more question here, which uh, basically says that, what is the role of industry? Because we have talked only about academia so far in global uh, collaborations and cooperation, right? But of course, industry plays a big role, not only in consumption, but often even generating new ideas and you know new research, even if it isn't applied. Right? So how do we involve industry in all of this? So we have started a little bit. I can just provide one example um, in, in the area of quantum information science. Um, we have recently um, created at the University of Chicago, a what we call Chicago quantum uh, exchange. And this is not just with us, but with our university, as well as the two national lab, Argonne National Lab and, and Fermi um, National Accelerator Lab, uh, who are involved. But on top of that, which is somewhat new to us, is really we have corporate partnership. 
that are embedded in that program, in which that program allows the free exchange um, of ideas, but also allow opportunities of students to work in a industrial environment for sort of, you know, the partnership and for us to push the area um, of the, the boundary of, of QIS into areas that may also be of interest to the corporate. So this is really something that has only been established for a couple of years at the university, uh, but we're very excited to see how that can give a completely yet, a, you know, a different dimension to the problem that we're trying to get at. And also is a very important piece of not only pushing the knowledge front, but also in the training of our students and the exposure that they have. Rupa, here, of course, I mean, not only um, industry in that sense, but we are, we are seeing how, how important philanthropy has become, right? And how philanthropy plays a role. So maybe you want to talk about You uh, actually, uh, I was thinking of that. You know, uh, philanthropy in earlier days used to be you know, more about charity, giving things back to the society. But I think it's more right now. It's uh, not limited to the feel-good impulse of giving back, but rooted in the vision of deepening and furthering everything uh, that traditionally we talked about in the university system. So, uh, the so this one thing that we are uh, talking about is uh, you know we we are funded. Our founder Shiv Narda is the founder of HCL Corporation. So I think. Uh, we have been in the last few months engaged with a lot of discussion with HCL, the corporate part, not the philanthropy part, not the foundation under which we come to talk about it. And I was, um, I mean, I knew that, but um, it just, I got reminded that uh, quantum information even figured there, quantum computing, everybody is talking about, HP is talking about, HCL is talking about, and we have been approached from from both sides. So I think it would go, but in many other sectors, Indian companies are still not, industry is still not into so much in R&D, barring a couple of sectors, say, you know, where pharma may be one, maybe automotive a little bit, rest of them import technology. And I, I hope the universities uh, like ours, who are the new age universities would take their rightful place in leading the technology sector and not always lagging behind. You know, right now we always respond to technology. We don't lead mm -hmm. that. And so I think that has to be the way. So I'm taking the discussion a little, uh, you know, ahead of, of that. So I think collaborations will come. It's happening already for us also. But we prioritize very carefully as to where we wish to go. There is no point spreading yourself too thin. But it's a very mm -hmm. good question because, you know, industry is essentially market uh, facing and universities are normally blue sky facing. So uh, the the two should meet because otherwise, you know, all these local problems governments keep throwing at you will never get solved. And I think we'll, the universities should actually create the market and not just get driven by the market. And I think uh, we need to get our rightful place back the way it used to be. We seem to have lost that quite a bit uh, of late. Technology has moved in an uh, in incredible pace, uh, but it's done by uh, researchers like us. I mean, uh, that's where it's stemming from. And then AI is essentially, as I see it, is a multiplier. And there is no replacement for hardcore work, you know, hardcore physical system work. Cyber uh, multiplication just adds value to it. But that's not the core of it. So I think people are forgetting the, the worth of basic science uh, research, which, you know, my days, at and Bell Labs uh, kind of places where you uh, brought in those kind of values. And I think we are going through some kind of a revolution of that kind in India right now. It's a little slow and a little uh, chaotic, but I, I strongly believe that universities have to lead the way. And mm -hmm. uh, that's happening. We are not looking at industry mm -hmm. just for placement. We are looking at a full-fledged 360-degree uh, tie-up with industry partners, and we have a very good setup for that. And so the results should come. Okay, thank you. Um, we are almost at the end of the time. So we'll stop uh, taking questions here. And uh, once again, you know, let me thank you both. This has been a riveting discussion. I think we could con continue, you know, the whole night here and for you the whole day, uh, but uh, we'll have to call it a day. <laughs> uh, but 
really, I think, you know, going forward, collaboration has to be much, much more central in all things that we do. And it's not only collaboration between researchers within a university across the same city, or it's all about collaboration globally, right? And I do see that, you know, some of the global problems that we facing, be it as big as like climate change, or, you know, even when we saw, for example, the um, ship getting stuck in Suez, Suez Canal, right? I mean, it's a small ship that has called global problems, right? So how can we not do global collaboration in research and all kinds of activities? So with that note, I thank all of you who has been very patient and been with us today. And thank you so much. I hope to see many of you again next week. Thank you.